Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Danbeck. On this edition, we'll visit North Dakota's best kept secret, enjoy the history of an area museum, and listen to the musical storytelling of a U.S. Army soldier. In 1916, the Nonpartisan League needed a candidate for North Dakota governor who had the strength of character to carry the league's banner into a bloody campaign. That candidate was Hoople, North Dakota potato farmer Lynn Fraser, the first governor elected by the Nonpartisan League and the first governor in the United States to be recalled from office. They called him the gentleman from North Dakota because he was a man of great manners and great, very civilized individual. Fraser was very professional, very thoughtful, very well organized, a strong work ethic, which would I think probably be his greatest personal quality. And that's the center of his family life, is doing what a, a man should do in a Christian household providing leadership, taking care of the future. You know, it's a big, big job. He was a straight-laced guy in Washington, D.C. He never went to any of the alcohol parties, which is how Congress worked even then. He always had people over to his house, family dinner. They'd get to sit down with his uh, family, his wife. They'd all sit there and have a big dinner and talk. So the man, fairly conservative in his own personal demeanor, considered probably one of the most virtuous family men and highly respected, but controversial at the same time. His pacifism and his ideas about government ownership as a way to achieve economic justice, those were fairly radical considering the Bolshevik Revolution. Oh boy, they painted him red and they painted him every color. He was not a red and he was not a communist. He was a Christian. He was so religious, there's no way he could have ever followed Marx. He's a pretty deep thinker. He went to UND when there are some very, very good people over in the poli and econ department. He definitely understood politics, agricultural problems, as good as anybody that was alive at the time. He was, I think, an expert. Lynn Fraser felt very strongly that the American farmer, they should have complete and total control of their product and, and the right to sell it at the price they dictated. Fraser stood up in the Senate again and again and again and told him that's all the farmer wants and wanted to create something in the way of a marketing board. It would have been a very, very powerful economic institution and it would have added a great deal of wealth, I think, to the countryside. Actually, in Canada, they took Fraser's idea and implemented a, a full bore up there with the Canadian Wheat Board. I think he had uh, some influence in the development of the common agricultural policy after World War II. He very clearly articulated the benefits of the cartel. That's what the European Union does. Farmers in Europe have to sell to their government corporations, and then the government corporations sell. Farm prices are not set by markets, they're set by government panels. The farmers have a big say in the determination of agricultural prices. Farm prices are much higher in Europe than they are in the United States. He obviously got something more than uh, sleep time out of his economics. <laughs> he was not in favor of repealing prohibition. When they started debating it in 1930, Senator Edge uh, talking about all the jobs that beer was going to create. <laughs> And Fraser got up and the Senate gave a speech about 20 minutes long that he had never really noticed that beer uh, got people working. <laughs> Lynn Fraser, he was a man that uh, made decisions, I think, based on principle rather than on political popularity. His pacifism, boy, he was a leader. Every single session that he was in the Senate, he introduced a constitutional amendment to prohibit the United States from entering war. 
When women's right to vote issue came, he assumed some leadership there, came right out in favor of it. When the bill was actually signed, there's a picture of that ceremony. And I, th I don't know, it's an awful lot of women that were invited to that signing. He was very, very happy to see women become part of the political process. Another thing I have to say about Frazier, to show his humanity, he developed very good relationships with the Indian tribes in the state. They spoke very highly of him. He was on the Indian Affairs Committee. He actually got roads, a basic infrastructure, into the reservation communities. He was the first politician that actually delivered bread and butter to the Indians, and the Indians had the utmost respect for the guy. North Dakotans can really be proud of him, although they've all forgotten him. When I ask people about Lynn Frazier, hardly ever do I run into someone in North Dakota that, oh yeah, Lynn Frazier, the governor that was recalled. They don't even know that. He did accomplish one heck of a lot more than even I imagined in my earlier days of researching him. As I've had a chance to look back on agricultural history in the world and in the United States, I see that Frazier really was an original thinker and uh, highly motivated to do the actual hard work willing to give up the place he loved, which was Hoople, North Dakota, go to Washington, D.C. And, and fight for all the people and try to get what he thought they wanted. But I think if he was disappointed, he carried it well and he carried it silently. Fraser's ideas were actually good ideas. And when he was knocked around and beat up pretty badly, did he turn into a whiner? No, I have to admire that. Established in the 1890s, the North Dakota Veterans Home is North Dakota's best kept secret. Incorporating a unique pod concept, it's the only veterans home in the country with this design. The building is home for many North Dakota veterans, but it's the tremendous staff that makes it feel like home. Welcome to the North Dakota Veterans Home. You know, we get calls every day saying I never knew about the North Dakota Veterans Home. This is North Dakota's best kept secret. We are in the 90 acre campus of the North Dakota Veterans Home in Lisbon. This campus is beautiful, it's full of trees and flowers and lots of memorials marking veteran service. Back in the 1890s, the city of Lisbon had the opportunity to become either the Valley City State College or the North Dakota Veterans Home. And they chose to be the North Dakota Veterans Home, which they called at that time the Soldiers Home. The first building that was built was in 1893. And then shortly after that, they built a hospital here on the campus. Well, they lived in the hospital up until the 30s. I think they had like about 26 beds. In 1950, they built a, so that we could have 150. There was additional buildings that were built in 1980. They then actually brought a nursing home on. There has been a VA mandate that wanted to look at the household neighborhood concept. Our building is the only building in the country that's built like this. Because of just the nature of, of everything in North Dakota, we decided to actually build it in the pod concept. We have two basic care pods and we have one nursing home pod. The pods themselves hold approximately 50 to 52 residents. We have two pods for basic care named B and C, and we have four households within a pod. There are four households in the B pod and four households in the C pod. And the households are anywhere from 10 to 13 people. And every house consists of a living room, dining room, kitchen area, a little office area with a computer, and then individualized rooms. Um, every resident here has their own room. This room is home to a resident. When a resident moves in, we want them to feel at home. The staff told me I got too much junk, but I made it home. And that's the thing, you can make it your home. But each house is uniquely different, and I think, to me, that's what makes it special and unique. 
You can be as friendly or as aloof as you want. There will be one house you walk in and they have all their tables pushed together and they all eat together. There's another house where all the tables in the dining room are separate and nobody really eats together. This is the main street of the North Dakota Veterans Home and we have this area. So in, during the winter months, our residents don't necessarily need to go downtown to Lisbon. We have a bank and a library and we have a barber and beauty shop here as well. So a lot of their business can be done inside of the building. This is a beautiful building, but that is not the selling point of this. The selling point comes in, in this day. You just watch any of them and there's always that smile. Good for you. They care for us. I don't mean you simply taking care of us. They care for us. Is your daughter gonna come? Yeah. What you would think about when you look at your own home, what makes your home your home. It's not necessarily the things, it's the people and it's the feeling. Should we read up one of the um, stories in the paper today? It was part of Wednesday, that, probably the most night. important and part, always in charge of besides the residents that live here being the most important, was the staffing. The CNA staff are called resident living specialists, so they're universal workers. RLSs are trained to be CNAs, dietary, so cooks, housekeeping, and activities. And so I would kind of compare the RLS staff to like a mom or a dad and that they do it all. We have a waiting list for our nursing home, um, but not for our basic care. Our basic care, we have openings. Veterans are eligible. Veterans that entered the military in North Dakota or spouses or surviving spouses of veterans and also veterans that served in a North Dakota regiment. We've had some veterans that have moved here from other states and as long as they get a 30-day residency in the state of North Dakota they would be eligible to apply at the Veterans Home. We understand it's a hard process. It's not easy leaving home and downsizing and moving away from family in some cases so, so we're here as a support system too as that transition takes place. The service organizations of North Dakota, for example, the AMVETS, the Vietnam Veterans of America, the VFW, the Legion, they have been so great in supporting us. They give us money for activities. We have two new rooms that we have been looking forward to for a long time. We have a wood shop and art studio. And the kids come, they make the residence days brighter. They ask them how they are. They say, thank you for your service. We're so grateful for the fellow North Dakotans that support the Veterans Home. When they passed the legislation uh, to build the new Veterans Home, what the state and what the legislature did is a true tribute to our veterans. And we are here for them in every way. Named after a local Norwegian immigrant, the Petter Engelstead Pioneer Village provides a living history of Thief River Falls from its early years as a rural community to its current importance as a regional economic hub. The part about this museum that makes it very unique is that so much of it is connected personally to the people that lived here. We put names on the items so that the people get credit for them, but also to personalize this museum so that it belongs to the people. We're in the Engelstead building as part of the Petter Engelstead Pioneer Village, which is on Oakland Park Road in Thief River Falls. Inga Giving solicited buildings from all over this area, and Inga asked Ralph Engelstead to please build a roof Ralph said, I'll build you a building. And so Ralph built this Engelstead building. Then he asked the board of directors to name the village for his grandfather, Petter Engelstead. When I first started here, that one of the first activities that we scheduled was called Park and Rec Pioneer Days. And for the first time in my life, I met Matt Langwin. 
One of the things that Matt will tell you is that when he was a child, his parents took him to museums, but he could never enjoy the museum because everything was behind a rope or under glass. And when he came here, he could sit in chairs, he could sit in the schoolhouse, he could pick books up and look at them, he could pick up dishes and look at them. And why that's an important factor is Matt is legally blind. Being legally blind and being able to get up, up close to it and touch things and feel things and getting up close really helped me in doing that. And other museums, that's not possible. You feel like you're taking a step back in time and you're, you're experiencing what life was like at a different time. And coming to this museum was the first time I ever had that experience. Before coming here, I, I never knew that life was different back at one time. Matt has learned to become a tour guide. He knows and memorizes everything about the village. He loves the history aspect of it. He had to actually cut it in half. And then uh, Inga Giving, who was the director at the time, actually wrote on uh, one of the halves when they brought it in. One of the spin-offs of the accessibility that came as a result of probably Matt's influence on me is that we have made policies throughout the village. Most of the time when kids come to a museum, they're forbidden to do so many things. And we tell them that we want them to have a good time. And one of the things we've warned them about is adults are not allowed to ring bells in the village. Only children can. Ringing those bells has become a big thing. There is a bell out by the tree, and there's one in the school, and there's one in the church. And the thing we also encourage is for families to come out and have a picnic here, to play school, to sit in the cabins and pretend they lived there and try to figure out where people lived, where they slept, how they'd take a bath. Big question is, where do you go to the bathroom? And most of them have never seen an outhouse. The one great northern depot that we have serves not as a depot museum, but as a museum of Thief River Falls. It has various rooms with different types of displays, like there's a car dealership, there's a beauty shop, and there's a lane that we call Typewriter Alley that has old typewriters. The Viking Depot served as a depot where the family lived. The building is preserved as a depot except for the freight room where we put the logging material. The schoolhouse was moved from southeast of town and it's pretty much the way it was except that the parts of it come together after it gets here like the desks. The rest of the village is a collection of stores and there's a Victorian house which we chose to paint like a painted lady because there's nothing colored out here, and there's uh, five full-size cabins, and there's a homestead cabin. In the future, Jamie Bakken will bring all of the fifth graders from the Challenger Middle School. Every kid in fifth grade now has come. There are Minnesota history standards in fifth grade um, in our social studies standards and so the main thing that we're looking at is how technology has changed over time. So the museum is very open to the children, you know, they can actually feel the books and touch the books and I think that's really great to have that part of history available to them rather than just, you know, you go to some other museums and everything's behind glass and don't touch, be quiet, and here the kids get to ring the school bell and, and do all that fun stuff. One of the things when visitors come through that you notice is the things like they will stop almost by the door and say, I turned one of those when I was a kid. And they remember things from their past. And in fact, one of the things I find a favorite vision is seeing a grandfather with a grandchild and telling the child the parts of a harness or the parts of a wagon and that kind of thing that grandparents and parents know. And the fact that it's a, a personal thing where that they can relate their own experiences to the buildings here and not just somebody else lived here but they can remember parts of their own lives that are here, are right here. Matthew Griswold is proud of his successful transition from U.S. Army soldier to singer-songwriter. His original music contains powerful messages that he appreciates sharing and performing to audiences across the Midwest.
this old man Said he is your life He pressed my tongue Against his knife But now that man Has gone away His sins will pass And the truth will fade There's a war And it's coming down on me There's a war and it's coming down on me She sits alone When the sun goes down She calls my name From across the town She runs from me To hide her pain like she runs from God To hide her shame There's a war And it's coming down on me There's a war And it's coming down on me As it can't recognize its own name So when you feel like you're fading away When you feel like you're fading away Just remove your disguise and look in his eyes And he won't recognize your own pain Even bliss cannot breach its own end I can see in the rapture foretold The seas will then mend And the waves will ascend As heaven and hell take control So when you feel like you're fading away When you feel like you're fading away Just remove your disguise And look in his eyes And he won't recognize your own pain you won't recognize your own pain Cause the dead cannot recognize pain No, 
the dead cannot recognize pain If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at Prairie Mosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Bob Dambach. And I'm Barb Gravel. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.